Okay, record. Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we have a special, uh, I guess we have a, a special duo today. Um, you might have seen them in the fall. We, they're back. Very happy to have them join us uh, once again. And that is Dr. Susan Orvis and uh, Dr. Rob uh, Dahlhausen. Oh. So welcome and thank you for joining us on this very important topic today. Um, so today we are covering uh, avian barnavirus and avian uh, ganglion neuritis. Um, your questions answered. Um, and I know you guys have a lot of territory to cover. So I believe you have a short presentation, uh, a presentation, we'll see how short it is or not. And then we're gonna answer, get to the, 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 the questions from, from our uh, large, I think we're gonna have a pretty robust attendance today. So this is definitely a topic that people uh, wanna know more about. So. I'm going to hand it off to you. I don't know which one of you is, is kickstarting this, but um, I'm going to yeah, start is. it. I'm going to start it. But, you know, I've got this darn screen for <laughs> Zoom right in front of where I need to start so, the slideshow. So, so let's see if we over. can get it. Yeah, here we go. Can yeah, you see it? Gallery. OK, there we go. OK, so I'm going to move this off to the side. But oh, and as you I'm sorry, as you as you um, set up, I'm just going to remind people that um, to please use the uh, Q&A button for your questions and not the chat feature. And uh, that way we can capture it better. So Q&A button and not the chat button for your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Thank you, Laura. OK, so Susan and I are going to give a brief review of avian bornavirus or ganglion neuritis or PDD. And uh, uh, we, we're, we'll probably cover a little bit of ground that was covered before. But what I hope to do, and there, there's some new material in here, what I'd like to do is just kind of hopefully answer a lot of the questions that you have with this presentation. So we'll go through this pretty quick. And we know back in the early 80s to mid 80s, there was a number of different reports, both here in the US and in Europe, about this wasting disease. And, and, and it's, it was first diagnosed in macaw species. And Susan, I think this is one of the first yep. birds that it was reported in by uh, uh, Dr. Ridgewayne Gallerstein, I think if I'm correct there. Yep, yep, out in San Diego, which is where I started in practice. So that was the, and I took this photograph of this bird. All righty. So the first bird that had PDD, okay? And the characteristics obviously were these birds were digesting, not digesting seeds, and they were passing whole seeds through their digestive tract and into the droppings. And when we did radiology on these birds, we'd seen uh, re retention of food material and enlarged crops. And then we've seen these very enlarged proventriculus here, like we see in this radiograph and then right here. And basically this organ just kind of dilated and became very thin walled. The ventriculus did too. And we know that's how birds chew their food. And so when they don't chew their seeds very well, we end up with seeds passing in the droppings, okay? And so the big question is, what did we call this back then? Well, since it was a macaws, we first called it macaw wasting disease. And then since it had proventricular dilatation, we called it PDD or proventricular dilatation disease. But I got question marks by these because we're going to see that later on. We're going to change the name for this syndrome here. Okay, so in the past, diagnosis was made with a crop biopsy. It's a pretty safe and easy procedure. And um, what they looked for was this characteristic inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes and plasma cells. And this was termed a lymphoplasmacytic ganglion neuritis. And so here you can see a nerve, oops, we can see a nerve coming through here. And then you see all this infiltrate in the nerve ganglia, okay? The problem with that was if we had a negative finding, it didn't rule out that we were dealing with PDD. It just meant we didn't either didn't have a good biopsy sample or the lesion was not present in the crop on these birds. And a little closer image here of this, this infiltrate of these inflammatory cells, nerve ganglia cell right here, okay? Um, Susan, I think when you were at Tennessee, yeah. you used to do yeah. this and, uh, you know, it was real suspicious of a viral etiology, and those who were very fortunate, like Susan was, to uh, have access to, to electron microscopy found that if they could immediately test feces that were passed in birds, oftentimes they would find these kind of ghost uh, viral type particles. But 
12 to 24 hours later, they were absent. And this is right. really important when we talk about, you know, the causative agent in avian borne virus. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into this in a, in a minute here. So we had this infiltrate of lymphocytes and plasma cells. This was most consistent with an inflammatory response, but it was not what we term a separative inflammatory response. So no bacteria were involved. This was more like that of a viral agent or an autoimmune response. So the characteristic of this lesion that we saw was, you know, equates to either a viral etiology or an autoimmune response. So a lot of, a number of different viruses were uh, proposed to cause this. And when they checked some of these birds, in some of the cases, they'd find enroviruses and rheoviruses and adeno-like viruses, but there really nothing consistent there. And it was interesting because back around 2000, 2001, we probed a number of different tissues from positive birds and we uh, uh, found a link to uh, paramyxovirus and we had a, a general set of primers that picked up the, the paramyxovirus genus and the majority of those birds with PDD would react to that on PCR. Well, it turns out that paramyxovirus and avian bornavirus are in the same family and there's an article out that shows how they share um, that certain genetic sequences that are identical between the two. So uh, that was early on, and we thought we were dealing with paramyxo. So we could test birds for this, but we really couldn't prove it. And, and then back around 2008, we had several reports. Two researchers, Kissler and Honkabori, came up with this correlation to uh, born a disease virus, and they, they called it avian born a virus because it can't, obviously came from birds. And there was a correlation between this virus and positive cases, histopath cases of PDD. So to confirm that this might be uh, the etiology of PDD, Texas A&M researchers, they satisfied Cox postulate. And basically what that means is they went ahead, they cultured born a virus from a positive PDD case, they injected it. And, th and this is highlighted because that's very important. And we'll get into transmission later on in the presentation, but you got to, but keep in mind, injection is very important. They injected three healthy cockatiels with this virus that they cultured. Two out of three birds developed clinical signs, very compatible with PDD about two to three months after they injected them. And they detected avian borne virus in three out of three of the birds. And, and three out of three of the birds had histopath confirmation of lesions that were very compatible with PDD. So um, in testing birds and for avian borne virus, everybody thought, well, this is very similar. We've got a viral etiology. You get the virus, you get the disease. Well, then we started testing birds, and that opened up the floodgates. We opened up a can of worms in a Pandora's box. Why? Because birds, people thought that if my bird was avian borne virus positive, that equated to PDD, and that was a fatal disease, and my bird was going to die, and it was very contagious throughout the aviary and throughout my, the other pet birds in my household. And I've got to tell you, there's nothing farther from the truth than these statements. Going back and testing birds and for avian borne virus, we found that this virus is widely distributed, both in captive and wild birds. Michael Lertz in Europe, in Germany, tested 27 positive out of 59 birds that were normal healthy birds coming to the clinic for a normal yearly physical exam. So that was a 45% rate of infection. There was an aviary that we tested that had 77 birds in it. 35 of those birds were positive for a 45% rate of infection. I went back and took samples that were submitted to my lab. We had 791 avian samples, and these were mainly blood and uh, clinical swab samples. 279 of those samples were positive for avian borne virus. 
I grant you, these were samples that were taken and submitted not for testing for PDD. So about 34%. So I've, I, I thought this was a pretty accurate figure of the incidence of this virus in the U.S. A wide scale survey of aviaries in Europe where they tested like over 1400 birds, they had a 23% positive rate. When we look at infection rate in canaries and wild waterfowl, we get this a very similar rate, 23% to 45%. So on the average, 30% of all birds, both in, in aviary collections and in the wild, and this, this holds true for South America in the wild also, one out of three birds are positive for avian bornivirus. So you know, if you've got three birds in your household or in your aviary, you've got it. So avian bornivirus is present in almost all aviary collections in the world. So let's go ahead, further, you know, sequencing of these different genotypes in that. Right now, we're up to about 15 different types of avian bornivirus. We have several different cytosine forms. We've got some passerine viruses uh, in finches and canaries. Um, we have some a waterborne, water bird, I'm sorry, bornivirus, and then uh, several different uh, unclassified, four different unclassified bornaviruses. So we're up to 15, and that's probably going to change in the future. Um, so originally reported in, in these macaw species, um, the most common species of citizen birds where we see bornivirus in is macaws, African greys, cockatoos, and Amazons. Interesting enough, the disease is, is uh, really lacking in Quaker parakeets, lovebirds, and parakeets. In fact, there was a study where uh, at Texas A&M, Jordan Gentry inoculated lovebirds with ABV 2 and 4, not a single one of those birds became diseased. So we know that this group of species are a little more resistant to this infection. And then as this field expanded, we found that there were lesions, compatible lesions in canaries and toucans and Canadian geese and peregrine falcons and probably over, over 80 species of birds, both captive in the, and in the wild. So bornavirus is pretty widespread. It's interesting because um, I was involved in a seminar with a researcher from uh, um, uh, Australia, and uh, he, he made the comment that, well, bornavirus is not present in Australia. And I'm thinking about all these waterfowl that migrate through there. Plus, you know, we've got macaw species that have been smuggled in, brought in, bred in, in Australia, aviaries. And so I really have to think that they've got bornavirus there. So, okay, so I, I wanna go back to this uh, fear that people had where my bird's got bornavirus and, oh, this is a severe disease, my bird's gonna die. And there's a natural law of infectious disease. When we have an agent that has a low rate of infection, generally we have pretty severe disease. And, and basically what happens is if it's a severe disease, it kills the host and the virus dies out. So we get this low rate of infection, okay? Well, this is what people thought here, severe disease with avian bornavirus. But again, this natural law of infectious disease, if we have an agent that has a high infection rate, we have no or very mild disease when it does occur. And this is very characteristic of bornaviral disease, avian ganglion neuritis, PDD. The worst case scenario, this wasted away bird that we saw initially in these macaws, again, that's the extreme. The vast majority of birds that are infected with avian bornavirus are perfectly normal. They will remain perfectly normal through their lifetime. And if disease starts, it, it's on a continuum. And if we intervene early on in the onset of disease, we can treat that reaction and we can actually save or improve the condition of a lot of these birds. So initially what we thought severe disease, now we've got a high infection rate and none or mild disease as far as avian bornavirus goes. 
We talk a little bit about transmission of bornavirus. Avian bornavirus is very fragile. Some of the research at Texas A&M um, showed that it remains viable for only less than six hours af after it's shed in the environment. And I think back when uh, Susan was testing, doing the EM on these fecal samples, after 24 hours, they couldn't find it. And that really, um, I think, uh, demonstrates that this virus is very fragile. We also know that it's shed in very small amounts in the droppings, okay? So rarely at these levels can it cause infection in another bird. So rarely do we see outbreaks of bornavirus going through an aviary. Not like say herpes or Pacheco's virus where we get these large aviary outbreaks. It takes- yeah, take, Bob, I, wanna, I just wanna yeah. inject one thing about that. So one of the problems that I think people had early on was that they'd, they'd find a bird that dies in an aviary. They, they, they you know do a histopath and they go, oh, it has PDD. because because we, we all thought there was only one form of the disease, which you're, you're kind of hinting that, that one form is that it affects the GI tract. But then they go, oh gosh, we got to test the rest of the flock. And then they would test the rest of this group of birds and there'd be a bunch of them that would be positive. That wouldn't 30, be showing 30%, signs. Yeah, 30%, yeah, 30%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're thinking, it's running through the aviary. No, those birds were sitting there and they had they were positive all along. They're perfectly and, normal and they will, most of them under right. good management conditions will remain normal for their lifetime. Right, right. So that's part of the problem that, that people have with this. As you said, this virus is fragile. So it's not like influenza where I, I have influenza, I sneeze and cough, I give it to the next person and they get sick right away. It's, exactly. it's not like that, okay? I, you're probably going to talk about that a little more, so I'll shut up. No, no, that's great. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about bornaviral transmission, okay? Bornavirus, we know it's shed in the urine and feces. And so this, you know, researchers, you know, theorize that this was a urofecal oral route of transmission, okay? Right. But right. horizontal transmission by direct contact from bird to bird is very inefficient, especially in immunocompetent birds. Bird to bird transmission is very, very uncommon. And to demonstrate that, again, researchers took naive cockatiels. They took live born of virus. They gavaged it in their crops to simulate ingestion of the virus. They dropped it in their nostrils to simulate inhalation of the virus. Not a single one of those birds converted to a positive viral status, okay? So this transmission from bird to bird, I don't wanna say it doesn't occur, but it really requires close contact for a long period of time. Very We're time. talking yeah. years, years before one bird gives it to another, okay? However, vertical transmission through the egg is now, and, and we talked about this, Helga Gerlach talked about oh, yeah. this, what, oh, yeah. back in, you know, 2000. The this is now, Inquisitor. Right. It is now thought to be a major route of transmission. I personally had a, a situation where we had a pair of Kias at the zoo. These birds were producing chicks, and about the time these birds weaned, let's say two months, two and a half months, when their immune, their immune system starts to become competent at that point in time, okay? And that's very important because we're gonna talk about this autoimmune component to PDD or ganglion neuritis later on here. But these birds would start to develop neurologic signs, digestive tract signs, and no matter what they did at the time, they really had a difficult time pulling these babies through. I went in, we tested, both parents were positive for avian born virus. I went ahead and they were artificially incubating these eggs and we tested the eggs that did not hatch. I had 21 out of 22 eggs were positive on the vitellin membrane for avian born virus. So vertical transmission, I think is, it is probably the major route. And I know Susan, you've run into some situations with some yep. uh, pet store, babies yeah. that were coming in and, and that really documented that vertical transmission is a major route of transmission of this. And, and I, 
and I think that it's important on that slide, Bob, to, to indicate to, to all of you who own birds, you know, when, when I have to deliver that bad news that your, your bird is born a positive or something, you go, well, how did it get it? You know, and, and the point is, in most cases, um, it didn't get it at your house if it's an adult bird. It, it got it while it was still a chick in the egg. Or shortly after hatching, it, you got a little. You got a little something extra when you bought the bird. You got the virus too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so they they want it. The, the, you know, they go. They got it at the pet store. Well, may, probably not. And you know, like you said, it's going to take. It, it often takes um, time of of the two birds sharing that space together. And in my my view, they have to at least eat the poop. All the time, you know. Yeah, or, or droppings in the water yeah. bowl and stuff right. like that. Yeah. But it's really the vertical transmission. I think is important, and and I wanted them to understand what that meant. That meant that that your bird became positive not then, but way back when it hatched. When it hatched, or right. shortly, either from the vitellin membrane or shortly after it picked it up in that. That those very first day, days. So that, that's the important aspect to that. An interesting aside, we were in histopathology and the embryos of the eggs that did not hatch. Mm -hmm. And not a single one of those had any lesions compatible with avian ganglionitis. okay? And that makes sense because the thought of this being an autoimmune disease, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, is very important because when these chicks hatch out, their immune system is not totally competent. And it's around the time of weaning when their system does become competent. And that's when we start to, well, at least with these kids, that's when we started to see disease yeah. showing up in these babies. It's a very important point to, to keep in mind. Okay, so avian ganglion neuritis, PDD, we got this pathology here. And I've got to tell you that avian bornivirus, this is from Dr. Rossi, is only the tip of the iceberg. We've got this whole big area down here to, con to, to consider. Um, bornivirus infection can either directly or indirectly cause damage to the, ner to the nerve cells, okay? The, either the axon or the nerve ganglia in that, okay? But that damage is not sufficient enough to cause disease. But what it does do is, is it exposes the nerve ganglioside proteins. When those proteins become exposed, we get an autoimmune response to that. And it's this autoimmune mechanism that really shows up in the pathology and, and the disease that we see with, with this condition. So, we know the ganglion neuritis can be induced by the virus invading the host nerve cells, okay? And in this process, it exposes normally sequestered nerve ganglioside proteins, which are part of that nerve membrane, okay? And when those proteins are exposed, the body views them, the host views them as foreign, and we get an immune reaction. We get antibody and we get T cell production. Uh, sensitization to these cells. Dr. Rossi has demonstrated this very well, and we get disease. And so this disease, PDD, uh, and, and Dr. Rossi's theory is an autoimmune disease, very, very similar to Guillain-Barre in humans, okay, where this host mounts an immune response to the, its own nerve ganglioside proteins. Here we, got a nor we have a normal nerve cell, and then here you can see where we get this immune reaction to the ganglioides that are part of the membrane here. And then we get this neuropathy that develops with that. The interesting thing is that there are over 60 different ganglioside proteins throughout the body in birds and people and so forth. And this distribution of these ganglioides varies throughout the nervous system, okay? We also, at least it's theorized now that these ganglioides, their location varies among different citizen species. Okay, so maybe with macaws, we have a high concentration of GM1 in the digestive tract. In cockatoos, it may be in the lower brainstem. And the theory is that's why we see differences in, in the infection or the disease that occurs. 
Okay, so the disease that we see is dependent upon the ganglioside that is recognized by the host immune system. Okay, also the distribution, the neurological distribution of those ganglioside's and the severity of that immune reaction. The common ones we have are GM1, GM2, GT1B. These are the ones that we use in our testing mainly, but then we have a mixture of a lot of the other ganglioside proteins. So avian ganglioneritis, the disease we see is variable. It depends on the ganglioside's recognized by the host immune system. And that really depends on their distribution of, you know, of the species, you know, in the host species involved. And so the lesions can be in the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, or autonomic nervous system. And the severity of the lesions, if they're minor, we'll see mild disease. If they're real severe and they're going to innervate an important part of that bird's body, we're going to see more severe disease. So uh, I'll just go through some of the different areas. The central nervous system, uh, let's begin with that, okay? The cerebrum. When we see lesions there, we'll see problems with vision. And this vision is not uh, uh, the inability of the retina to sense light, but it's, an, it's a cortical blindness. It's an inability of the higher brain to put together that image, okay? And Susan had a great case with that, we'll probably right, get to right, that right. when we talk about uh, treatment. Seizures, you know, we'll see seizure activity. And this is really common in African gray parrots and Amazon parrots. We, I, I, I have seen this in macaw species, but it's been many macaws and these seizures has been very focal. In other words, we'll have like twitching of one limb that would, you know, involuntary twitching that would just go on and on for minutes. And, and cockatoos too. You see them yeah. In yeah, yeah, yeah. We see a lot of um, when when they're really severely infected, we we we, we do see that. Yes, um, lesions in the cerebellum. Okay, we'll see ataxia, incoordination, and proprioceptive deficits, and and that's really common in cockatoo species. I see very few macaws that are wobbly and kind of drunk acting when they walk. Okay, and and getting back to Susan's comments about. Um, these uh, seizure activity. When I see it in cockatoo species, these are birds that are really severely infected. They've got, they tend to show these signs first in the cerebellum, and then we start to see the higher brainstem uh, signs. Autonomic nervous system. Hey, Bob, you're yeah. at a half an hour, by the way. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, hurry up here. Okay. Autonomic nervous system. Thank you. GI tract signs, uh, dorsal vagal nucleus, cranial nerve 10. And Susan know this. So uh, she, she, she just hammers this to us. Uh, these nerves innervate the crop proventriculus, ventriculus, and small intestine, upper small intestine. When we have that involvement, we see it mainly in macaws and conures. That's your typical PDD. Cardiovascular system the heart rate, blood pressure. We'll see that in African gray parrots. This was a gray, and you can see this bird was just picking at this area, of the, you know, the chest. This bird literally fell off its perch and died. And when we did histopathology, it had lesions of avian ganglioneritis in the conduction pathway of the heart. Adrenal glands, this fight or flight, you know, uh, uh, response, epinephrine, adrenaline, and so forth. We see a lot of birds that are very hypersensitive to environmental stimuli. I mean, these birds, you know, you tap your pen on the desk and they fall off the perch, basically. So, um, you know, the autonomic nervous system can be involved. We we'll also see the peripheral nervous system. And this uh, Burhane had a really nice paper on peripheral neuritis in birds. And we, this is a kind of a contribution to feather destructive behavior and self mutilation. You see this cockatoo here, and you can see how these birds are picking at the level of the skin. This African gray here, just, just chewing at its legs. And most of these lesions, you know, we can't confirm them until after the bird dies. And these lesions will be in the dorsal root of the spinal cord or the sensory root of the spinal cord, okay? Avian ganglioneritis, there's a, a condition called, um, we know it's not immune disease, but there's a condition called molecular mimicry. And this is very important to understand. 
infections with Campylobacter um, in the digestive tract, but also Mycoplasma, Haemophilus, Influenza, and Paramyxovirus, okay, can produce antibodies that cross-react with different ganglioside proteins in the host, okay? So any of these agents potentially can cause ganglioneuritis or PDD. So uh, here's Campylobacter. We get an immune response. We get antibody production, activated TMB cells, antibodies produced, and they cross-react with the membranes the, the, of the nerves, okay, and the nerve ganglia. So getting back to this, you know, avian ganglioneuritis pathology, we know Bornavirus can do this, but through this autoimmune mechanism and antigenic mimicry, all these other agents, okay, including herpes virus, can cause antibody or an immune system reaction that causes pathology indistinguishable from PDD, okay? And so here's a list just to, just to show mycoplasma antibodies to GM1, uh, Haemophilus GT1A, Paramexo, Orthomexo, Herpes virus, GM2, Campylobacter, and so forth. So what do we call this? Well, we can't really call it macaw wasting disease. We can't really call it proventricular dilatation disease. We call it avian ganglioneuritis because we have birds that only show lesions in the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, and so forth. Okay, the, the dilemma here was that birds with classic signs of PDD were, when they looked at tissues, they did PCR, they couldn't find Bornavirus, and that was through immunohistochemistry and PCR. So Dr. Rossi had this theory, can ganglioside sensitization satisfy the Cox postulates? He injected purified avian ganglioside protein into cockatiels, either intraperitoneally or orally, okay? In one month, 100% of the, the IP injected birds and one third of the oral ones developed CNS and GI tract signs compatible with PDD. Crop biopsies were indistinguishable from PDD. So he produced PDD or ganglioneuritis without Bornavirus being present, okay? And we'll just go through this. There's a characteristic lesions there. So avian ganglioneuritis, must be considered in any clinical disease that may be of neurogenic in origin, okay? So anything that can be related to a neurogenic or neurologic dysfunction in that bird, you've got to consider avian ganglioneuritis. And that may or may not involve avian bornavirus, okay? So Dr. Rossi, along with the, several of the German, um, Dr. Mueller, uh, Michael Lertz, and so forth, uh, looked at antibodies to the ganglioside, anti-ganglioside antibodies in, in birds. They examined over 1140 serum samples from 21 different species of parrots, okay? They looked for avian bornavirus and anti-ganglioside antibodies, okay? Also, a number of these birds, they had confirmation through histopathology of PDD, okay? They had a 98% correlation between histopath lesions and the ELISA, positive ELISA results for anti-ganglioside antibodies, okay? This is the test now that we're offering here in the States. I have to tell you is that rarely now am I testing birds for avian bornavirus because one out of three birds will test positive for it. The AGA anti-ganglioside antibody assay more accurately detects clinical disease birds. 98% of the birds with clinical disease had elevated AGA levels regardless of the presence of avian bornavirus, okay? So basically that's my quick summary, which lasted over a half hour. We can talk about treatment. Celebrex is what we began with. Um, Susan had this keep bird. Keep going, keep going, yeah. Well well, we can talk about treatment, I think, when we, when we get to questions, don't you think, kids? Yeah, just, uh, maybe, just make yeah, a go few... Go say something about Medicam, though. Yeah, a few quick um, comments. A lot of veterinarians recommend meloxicam. It's a COX-2 selective inhibitor. 
Celebrex is a COX-2 pure inhibitor, specific inhibitor. That's important because you get high doses of metacameron or use it for long periods of time, it will inhibit the uh, beneficial COX-1 enzyme, which is for platelet aggregation, GI tract, you know, crop, or, you know, protectant, cellular protectant, I'm sorry. And the other thing, it's orally formulated for the dog and cat. And we know that birds have a more acidic GI tract. And so you got to look at the absorption for this to be effective. It's got to be absorbed from that GI tract. And so the dosing on this really has got to be a lot higher. And actually, there was one study where they reported that in using Medicam, it made the symptoms worse in cockatiels. So I'm not sure how accurate that study was, but um, what we've gone to nowadays is rabenicoxib by giving it intramuscularly. Um, it's just like Celebrex. It's, it's a selective COX-2 inhibitor, and we bypass absorption from the GI tract because even in cockatoos with neurologic signs, we will see lesions in the wall of the digestive tract, okay? So we have to assume that the absorption of any of these orally administered medications is, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's not um, ideal. And um, by giving an IM, we bypass it absorption from the gut. Um, once every five to seven days works really, really well in birds, very, very safe. Um, I don't know of any reports of any toxicities with this, and we'll treat for four to, four to eight weeks, generally three to six on the average, and we have a very nice response with this. So um, closing remarks, Bornavirus is present in healthy birds. A lot of these birds will show no signs of clinical disease. We do know that infection with Bornavirus is lifelong. So if you get a negative test on a bird, doesn't mean they don't have it. You probably have to run three or four, you know, tests, a test every two to three weeks, uh, one to three weeks. And then if all of those tests are negative, you're pretty certain the bird doesn't have it. If it's positive, that bird's going to have it for the rest of their life. We do know that periods of stress, especially during the breeding season, reproductive activity can cause this virus to kind of activate. And that's oftentimes we'll see an influx of clinical disease in these birds. So this virus, the disease itself fluctuates from dormancy and activation, periods of activation is triggered by stress, immunosuppression, elevated reproductive status. Clinical disease is induced by an autoimmune mechanism and it could be induced by other infections through this process of molecular mimicry. So we can have disease uh, without, with or without the presence of avian borne of virus. So um, any infection that exposes nerve ganglion sites to the host immune system and elicits a suitable immune response can produce disease that is compatible with PDD or avian ganglion neuritis. Um, I'll finish with this slide by Dr. Rossi. If it's true that ABV infection is a cause of PDD, it's not equally true that PDD is caused only by avian borne virus. Thank you. That's it. Do you have anything to add to <laughs> at this point? Or should we go? No, no, we let's, let's just start off with some questions, I think. I think that'd be the better way to go. Okay. Sounds good. All right, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, okay, here we go, um, my last one. This one is from Daniela. She uh, my seven-year-old female Pionis uh, case has puzzled the vet. The bird ha has had progressively worse regurgitation for three plus years after she became an adult. No other hormonal behavior or neurological signs. She recently tested ABV slash PCR uh, positive, but AGAA negative. Also yeast infection in crop, uh, they treated but didn't curb regurgitation. Crop and fecal gram stains are normal. CBC and x-rays are normal. Weight is stable. So she be treated with, um, is it Onzior? Even though her AGAA was negative and or tested for other, or should, be, should they be tested for other diseases? Yes, wow. I, would, I would treat this bird with um, Onzior rabenicoxib because we find it's very, very effective uh, it's a great anti-inflammatory. Obviously, there's some sort of inflammatory process. Something's causing this mm -hmm. bird to regurgitate. However, on x-rays and so forth, you have no signs that are showing crop enlargement or GI tract enlargement. Um, we do know that um, 
with the AGA level, um, there, there, it's, it, there's kind of a gray zone. You know, it's not just black or white. We got negatives and positives. We get a lot of values in between. And um, we're kind of in the process. That the more we test, we're re kind of refining those, those cutoffs and that. Um, but a lot of these birds initially will test negative. And if you test them several months down the road, if it is due to avian ganglion ritis, they will show up and uh, start to develop an antibody assay. So they may want to retest that bird for AGAA. And um, if they put a little note in there to check the previous level of it, I can determine whether the, the level of the antibody is increasing or decreasing or staying the same. And then I, I'd like to add too that it, it's best to test when the bird is more hormonal. Exactly. Because yes. that's going to give them a better indicator if that's the cause. And and, and then the other thing is that um, I would do things like a crop gram stain in cytology. I mean, this could be something that's just a, a GI event, or there could be a link um, as Bob, you know, like, okay, maybe this isn't some pure black and white thing uh, where it's positive or negative, but it's contributing to it. So I thought you said it was born a positive, right, Laura? So um, I think you said that. So I would say that this is still definitely in the mix. It, it just hasn't maybe converted where you have this tremendous inflammatory response where they can pick it up from the AGAA. And I think this bird would definitely benefit potentially from giving it some, some Lupron or a Deserellin implant uh, with Robenicoxib or just start with a Robenicoxib to start with um, and see if it improves. I bet it will improve with just the Robenicoxib. And on a, yeah. on a bird of that size, I probably would give that Robenicoxib maybe every four days. Bob, four to five days? Well, it, it's not shown real severe disease. You maybe start off every four or five for one or two injections and then yeah. increase yeah. to once a week. Um, but an, uh, an oral, uh, oral pharyngeal swab, a crop swab and a fecal, do those gram stains because so many times there's an underlying bacterial problem. Um, we've even seen problems with um, clostridial agents in the lower intestinal tract. And we do know that that organism does produce certain neurotoxins and that, that can retard, you know, movement through the GI the tract. Robotocoxib, right, will help regardless. Right. Yeah, that's, Robotocoxib has been an benefit. agent that yeah. it, it, I, we use it so much. It's so beneficial and it works really, really well in birds. Next question. All right, this one is from Nancy. Uh, you had mentioned that Amazons are one of the genus that where the ABV is more common and they wanna know what about Pionis parrots? So what's I, the status on Pionis? Uh, I don't see it really commonly in Pionis. Do you, Susan? No, no, but it, it could be the fact well, that we, we see fewer Pionis. I mean, it, yeah. that, that, that could be what, what you see. Uh, so I, th I think, I think if you yeah, if you test them for Bornavirus, you're probably going to find, you know, it's there. But as far as do we see clinical disease in Pionis, I less. really, it's, it's, it's a lot less than, you know, macaws and cockatoos, Amazons, Conyers. Next. Okay. Uh, this one is directed specifically to you, Susan. Uh, this is from Allison. What diet do you recommend for non-critical birds with active GI sy symptoms um, from AG? Uh, we instinctively want them to eat and offer a wide variety of comfort foods, often trying different warm, soft foods just to get them to maintain weight. Is this possibly more harmful in the more uh, variety of foods can encourage hormonal instincts? So what you feed, can that? Uh, okay, me? so um, I'm, I'm not, I'm a little concerned about the question, Laura, it, are they saying that, and maybe Bob can interpret this better. If you have, are you talking about the bird in the period of time where they're they're born a positive, but they don't have clinical symptoms, uh, or, does, it, or does it have clinical symptoms? There's non-critical birds with active GI symptoms from active, AG, but they still have active GI symptoms, right? Yes. Okay. So they're clinical. Yeah. So if they have clinical symptoms, you're going to have to have a very digestible diet because what's happening is is that 
some part of that GI tract is not working correctly. Now, the, the best way to figure that out is either what you'd love to do is throw them in front of a fluoroscope and watch the movement of the GI tract. And the, the, so, so the 10th cranial nerve is being affected, but, but where is it being affected? And, and commonly, it has to do with that. And that's why the proventriculus gets enlarged, because the stomach, which is the proventricular part of the stomach, is not performing right. So when that happens, you have to have something that's very digestible. That's why the original thing of seeing seeds in the fecal was a clue for this disease process, because the proventricus ventricus wasn't working and there wasn't the grinding action of the proventriculus. So when that happens, I have to tell you, because I was one of the people that originally worked on the Lefebvre critical care diet, that that would be what I would use often. Now, the, the, the thing about the, the critical care diet is it's very absorbable. So, and, and then I get, because I'm a purist, I get, I get a little fussy about the use of the word critical care diet. So the Lefebvre critical care diet is a true critical care diet. It, it, is, it is partially digested. It has diantripeptides, isoamino acids. Those are in the form that the gut just absorbs, okay? When other companies, I'm not gonna say their names because I'm a little fussy about that, call it a critical care diet, it is not. It is, it is, a, it is a diet a little bit, a step up. So they don't have a pre-digested diet. So when you have a bird that is having, truly having difficulty digesting and in order to absorb properly, they, they have to use that Lefebvre diet. If they don't have that problem, then they don't necessarily have to use that diet. Is that is that the question that's being asked? Because that's well, my answer. I'm sorry, part of the question well, is, yeah. sorry, uh, is uh, about uh, also the warm soft foods um, to help them maintain weight. Can that cause uh, uh, like hormonal instincts? Can that? Can yeah, that it can. I mean, that can. And, you know, the hormone pro problem is, is a problem <clears throat> because, because when they have this ganglion neuritis issue, <clears throat> the... My theory, which is kind of what Bob is talking about, is that um, when the hormones go up, that's a trigger. That's why I'm an, I'm a little bit older, Bob. I still test for avian hormones. <laughs> so that when I know that when those hormones go up, that's going to be a trigger for the virus to start replicating. Right. So... So that is a problem. You can still feed very soft food, it just doesn't have to be warmed. You can feed it chop, you know, those types of things. So, um, so those are to things your, to consider. Getting back to your comments about the, the favor diet, that elemental diet is so important because when those when that nutrient gets into the digestive tract and into the intestines, it just has to be absorbed. It doesn't require any digestion, any breakdown. And that's what I think separates this critical care formula from other critical care formulas. Yeah, the other one shouldn't be named a critical care formula. If, if, right, if, I agree. If, if, unless they do that. If they do that, then that's then, that, then it's an appropriate term. But but that's another Agreed. discussion. Okay, and just, uh, just to, uh, that's the Lefebvre uh, Emirate. That's the Emirate diet. And that yeah. requires a vet uh, prescription. Um, Correct. So you have right. to go through your vet, but it's well worth right. it, obviously. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Big uh, difference. Okay. And then is there any evidence that the virus is passed from one bird to another when they feed each other? Uh, you know, like the, yes. when they're uh, regurgitating with the mates or, or chicks? Yeah, that's probably, that's one of the times that it's transferred. Yes. It, yes. But you got to go back. Yes. You got to go back and look at the um, infectivity studies where they gavaged live virus into these birds and none of the birds converted to positive status. So even though the virus can be transferred that way, it's very difficult to produce an infected state in that recipient bird. Okay. But it um, can happen. It can happen. Yeah, it takes a long time. 
All right. And then this one is, uh, okay, so is ABB considered a possible etiology for wing flipping and toe tapping in eclectus parrots? You've heard yes. about toe tapping in eclectus parrots. Is this a connection? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I agree. I, I, I've always thought um, there, there was this theory that it was because the vitamin levels were wrong. Vitamin A. There, there was vitamin a big talk a. about that. Yeah. Never found uh, that to as, be the as case. As a former neuro person uh, who got, was trained in neuroanatomy, the, that toe tapping and wing flipping, that's a neurologic condition. Vitamin A typically has nothing to do with the neuro, with the nervous system in that regard. No, uh, I will see that. <laughs> Getting back to that one. Hold on a minute. I'll see that in some birds that are... <laughs> I will see that in some eclectus that are toxic, but you're going to oh, yeah, see yeah. Yeah, you're going to see changes on the CBC, okay, that correspond and in, in put you in that direction, okay. But if the CBC is perfectly normal and they're doing it, test them for AGAA or treat them with Onsior. Bob, you are absolutely right because thank you because of the toxin aspect. Right. I mean that they are from a very pristine environment where they come oh. from. Yeah. And so we've put them in, you know, the United States that has a lot of toxins, airborne, everything else. Water. And, yeah. and water. And so it, it, they probably, and, and the veterinarian only knows to test for, for lead and zinc, but, but, and they'll be probably be negative for those, but that doesn't mean that they're not toxic and they will wing flip because it is affecting their nervous system. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And that's one thing that people don't, don't think about. Are you ready for next one? Yeah. Yep. This comes from Carol. Um, since the transmission seems mostly vertical with many chicks being positive that the parents are, wouldn't there be a, a high mortality rate in chicks for this? Not necessarily. There's a high infectivity rate, but again, we don't see, we, we had a high morbidity rate in the Kias. We did not have a high mortality rate with them, but we see a lot of birds that go through uh, the pet chain, the pet store system. We had one particular aviary that pulled the eggs and artificially incubated them. And we had a large number of those babies that would then, you know, when they were still young, go on to start to show some clinical signs. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a bird that's sick or that's going to die from it. Okay. Um, and what, yeah. Is there, I don't know, uh, any, any difference in male or females, or is it across the board even? I, I thought that, I thought Michael Lears did that, and there, there wasn't a difference. Not, not much, no. Mm -mm. I don't think there is much. And, and, you know, the other thing is that we don't talk about antibodies to this, but when the, when the hen is, is able to feed the chick, um, it, there might be some immune factors that are imparted so that those young birds don't die. We, we don't know enough about that, though. I, so I can't really comment that much, but I'm assuming that's part of it. Okay. And then someone said it was mentioned that uh, mutilation on the legs would be coming from the spinal cord area. Have you noticed any correlation between the wing pit mutilation and ABV or AGG? Or what area the disease may be manifesting from there, if there's a link? So, so the, the point about that is that <clears throat> when you have birds mutilating anywhere, wings, chest, legs, there, there are multiple reasons that this can occur, okay? So, so there, there can be a neurologic reason. The neurologic reason could be coming from the spinal cord itself in terms of it's bony, the vertebral column impinging. That's one reason. There could be something affecting the spinal cord. And th there was a picture that Bob showed by Berhane where in the spinal cord, the Borna virus had attacked some of the, ce the cells within the spinal cord and that made the bird itchy. There's also some work that Dr. Eccles has done where there could be changes in blood flow. Um, there can be skin conditions. I mean, mutilation, we, we really don't have this quick silver bullet up 
oh, it's mutilating, it's this. But, but there are multiple reasons, one of which can be born a virus that is, or, or some other factor like avian ga ganglion neuritis that is, that is affecting the spinal, the spinal cord itself. Yeah, you know, uh, to make a comment on that, we have a lot of people who do skin biopsies and the vast majority of the time you get those biopsies back and it just shows secondary, you know, damage to the cells and that and to the tissues. Um, I find when we have birds that are picking or, you know, feather destructive behavior, but it's at the level of the skin, it's either neurogenic in nature or it's a... Um, it's an inflammatory and allergic nature, okay? Allergenic in nature. Um, birds with um, allergies, for instance, and we live in Ohio River Valley here, we get a lot of mold allergies. And these birds will show a very characteristic pattern. They'll pick in the ventral patagial region of the wings and they'll pick inside the thighs. And it, you look at these birds and they're perfectly naked in those areas. And when I see that, um, we'll run, you know, run a CBC on these birds because you'll get that pattern with some toxicities too. Um, it can trigger this allergic type pattern of what I term feather picking, but um, neurogenic or allergic for the most part, rarely, rarely do I see an, infect, an, an infectious agent causing this. Uh, when we do, it's uh, usually in the wing web and it may be something like a superficial uh, fungal infection, like a dermatophyte of some for, sort. But um, yeah, the, the, the biopsies, the skin biopsies, at least in, in my hands have not been very informative. I like to I like to swab the skin and look at it. That's a good idea. Gram stain. Gram stain yeah. cytology. You bet. Yeah, but the, but but by doing that biopsy, it's the tip of the iceberg again. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Next. And sorry. So a question about endangered bird conservation programs. What is the indication for bonavirus for a bonavirus positive bird? So what would they be looking for? It'll be positive. That doesn't mean it has disease, right? That, that, that was a big problem with the Spix macaw. Yeah. And I'm not sure where they're at with that now, but um, you know, if, if they can determine that individuals that are negative, they need to isolate those individuals. That takes a lot of testing. One test doesn't, doesn't prove that they're negative. And I would definitely isolate and propagate those birds, but in a species that's endangered like that, um, it, you know, it still doesn't mean you shouldn't propagate them. I mean, we've got one third of our birds in the aviaries that are born of virus positive. I think, you know, through proper management and that you can maintain avian ganglion neuritis at a minimum or non-existent in those positive ABV positive birds. Again, it's proper husbandry and management, reduce stress. This one comes from um, Dr. Soga in Japan. So welcome, thanks for joining us from afar. Um, how much is it digested and absorbed by giving uh, the Lefebvre omnivore when showing ABV uh, gastrointestinal symptoms? Say that again. Uh, they say, how much, um, how much is it digested and absorbed uh, when you give the Lefebvre omnivore? I'm, I'm guessing it's the emirate omnivore yeah. diet. Emery, um, yeah. When the, when the bird is showing ABV gastrointestinal symptoms. Yeah, it, it's as good as it'll get. Agreed. So, so the, the problem is that each bird is an individual because each bird has been affected. And that, that's why this is so difficult for everyone <clears throat> because, because it isn't, ah, one size fits all. It depends where the virus has affected the nervous system, determines the symptoms, determines and the and the the uh, the genome of it, the genotype, right? Is it, it also determines that because there's going to be differences in severity of disease. So then, neurologically, you're going to have a difference in the uh, amount of of changes in the GI tract. And, and what it's doing, <clears throat> what the Borna virus is doing <clears throat> is it's affecting the 10th cranial nerve and its ability to 
to cause normal motility patterns, which are needed for absorption. Digestion and, and absorption, and right. This whole yeah. gut, gut brain axis thing, which we're not gonna, we don't have time today. But, but the, the diet that Dr. Clasing designed, the Emirate Critical Care Diet, <clears throat> is the most, <clears throat> sorry, is the most absorptive diet they have available. Now, <clears throat> for if you're a, if you're a veterinarian and you're, <clears throat> and you're the owner and you're working with this diet and you can't maintain that bird uh, in combination with things like rabenicoxib, that, that I would be injecting that bird with rabenicoxib. You might have to use metacopramide to try to help propel the GI tract properly. But there's, there's a couple of little tricks that he taught me to try to add into this. And one of them is egg. One of them is it increased amounts of, um, uh, of fats. So there are other things that we can play around with, but if you have a, a bird that's really having tremendous absorptive problems, the only diet on the market that will pr produce the most absorption because of the way it was designed with the diantriopeptides, peptides, the isoamino acids, the fatty acids that he put in there, that's gonna give your most benefit of absorption in the small intestine. Okay. okay. All right. um, and then uh, we had a question that someone wanted to know, what are the top labs in the United States for AGA testing? Labs. <laughs> We're the only ones that do it in the US. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, the that was only easy. one and the only good one for even well, born testing. Okay. Next you know, we, we do a lot of born testing, but um, actually we license the, uh, the, the AGAA test is a patented assay. We ended up licensing it from the University of Camerino in Italy, and we're the only one in the U.S. that does it. So. Okay, there you go. Um, and then uh, <laughs> someone had a question, is it possible for their Congo African Grey to go 12 years between flare, um, flares of symptoms? Perfectly Absolutely. healthy in between, only treatment is uh, prop prophylactic hormone shots when needed and uh, will repeat AGAA test uh, in positive correlate severity of the AG, of AG. So if they repeat the AGAA test um, in positive correlation with the severity of AG, is that? I don't think they, they've got a positive. So one, Bob, so. Uh, yeah, well, they, seen... they've got a bird that's positive, and, and so they know when it flares up, they know how to manage it. They're, they really right. don't need to be testing AGAA levels. Um, Again. And, and I yeah. guess uh, do AGAA levels correlate with the severity of disease um, in a way, possibly, but also uh, it, it not only how much antibody is present, but how long it's been present for, the longer it's present, we're going to have more severe disease. So there's a number of factors involved with that. Okay. All right. You ready for another one? I think we'll go with sure. so many great questions. Let's go. Okay, here we go. I like it. So, so uh, let's see, the question says my, AB, um, my ABV plus, um, positive, um, ABV plus positive cockatiel has seizures and chatters um, his beak. We've been treating the seizures with uh, KBR, but he's having more breakthrough seizures. Should we be treating the ABV? Does that sound? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I think for metacoxib will help him regardless. Um, it would be interesting to see uh, what his AGA levels are, um, whether because we're assuming that it's uh, avian ganglion neuritis and it may not be. Um, I just don't see a lot of clinical disease in cockatiels, and that's been one of my criticisms about the research studies because they use cockatiels as this model. But clinically speaking, do I see cockatiels coming in with ganglioneritis? It's, it's pretty unusual. Rare. Okay. Yeah, it's rare. And so, um, you know, for that bird, there are birds that have what we term a low seizure threshold. Um you know, you catch them up and handle them and they go into seizures. Uh, that's one possibility. I and definitely- Because you, you, honestly, I just gonna butt in because like Latinos will do that, Latino cocktails. Yes. So there's, a, yes. there's an inbreeding factor there. Right, you know, I that. agree. 
And then, you know, you really need to look at a good CBC and check the spurt for toxicity because toxicities will do that. As far as gangrene, and cockatiels, and it disease. is rare. Heart disease also, yes, that's a good one, Susan, you're right. We're not so good on evaluating heart disease in these older birds. I got to come up and work with you a little bit more on that. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. And then someone has commented, um, I read there was an ABV vaccine in the works back in 2017. Is that still being worked on? Is that, do you guys have any insight on that? An to ABV my vaccine? knowledge, to my knowledge, it's not being worked on. Um, the problem with that was in doing so, um, there were developing antibodies that, um, potentially could cross-react with the central nervous system, with the nervous system, I should say. Um, and the, the, there was a lot of criticism that they may actually induce the disease by giving this vaccine. So um, I haven't seen any work come out on that for, gosh, a number of years, years now. now. Yeah, it's been a long time. I think it's been dropped. Okay. And then this question goes to you, Dr. Bob. Uh, can tests from Canada be sent down to you? <laughs> No, no, it is so difficult to get, you know, the, the permits. Um, it, it, we tried, and it is really tough with USDA and fish and wildlife is another factor because a lot of these birds are listed appendix one and we just can't trade in, in those samples. Oh, wow. Okay. That's unfortunate. Um, so someone they've had got, a question. They've got someone that would like to set it up up there. I'm sure we can make some arrangements with the, uh, uh, Italy and that and have somebody run it up there in Canada there get go. a good lab up there. Well, I'll work with them. All right. Some, there's a positive solve there, if possible. Uh, someone had a question. Um, if a macaw is tested positive a year after the first test, do you keep them on um, on Onosaur? And will they, uh, yes, on a, sorry. Uh, and will they always test positive? I think, I think you mentioned that. Uh, what kind of test? Are we talking gangliocide or bornivirus? Um, hmm. if it's born of ours, if, if they've got born of ours, it's like herpes. Once infected, you've got to consider them infected for life. Gangliocide levels will fluctuate. Um, I've had some birds where we treat them for three to six weeks and, and that's it. And then they're fine for several years yes. after. I've had others that we've got to come back a month or two later and run them through another series. It is quite variable. Okay. And then, um, so then someone has a macaw AG po um, positive with only mild to medium plucking and no other symptoms. Currently on Celebrex plus uh, Vet Omega and uh, Visbi Visbiome, is that right? Yep. Visbiome's good. Yep. Yep. If not visible results, would you recommend switching to on a yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would try three weeks, right. three to four weeks of on probably 10 milligrams per kilogram once every five to seven days and do it for a month and see if you don't see improvement with it. Um, that feather picking may or may not be related. We have a lot of other causes of feather picking and, and usually with ganglion neuritis, they're picking at the level of the skin. Um, of course, I, I need to clarify that because these birds that are hypersensitive to environmental stimuli will tend to do psychogenic feather picking where they're actually just V-notching feathers. So that can be caused by ganglionitis also in that regard. Okay. All right. All right. I think we, uh, let's see, we're getting close to our, uh, but, but just to, uh, I mean, hopefully you guys if you don't, if you have a more generous time to, to offer us up in the future to, to come back and revisit this, because we, we can revisit, we can definitely Absolutely. revisit. But, but, Absolutely. But Laura, let me, let me say things before as people stop dropping out on us. Uh, Bob sure. and I are going to talk about this again in person, live, uh, a live show um, at the uh, Phoenix Landing Wellness Retreat, which is in person this year. Um, it mm -hmm. will be in Asheville, North Carolina. June 4th and 5th, which is a weekend, um, because housing is, is at a premium in uh, Asheville. Um, the reason we picked that weekend was because uh, classes are not in session. So we're going to be able to um, use the dorm room so it will be significantly cheaper uh, for people to come and stay, you know, if, that, if that's an issue. Um, and we have a huge 
we well, I shouldn't say huge, but we have a really nice number of speakers. Yeah, that's um, a good program this year. Um, and with a lot of different topics and you know, re revolving talks all day long and you get to be with bird friends and wow. it's a hell of a lot of fun. Gosh, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a really good program and does a great job putting it on. Yeah, nice. And just, uh, I mean, just, it's, it's been so informative just seeing you guys bounce ideas off each other during the Zoom meeting. I, I can't, I mean, yeah, yeah. so we do that there. I mean, we, we have question and answer periods there with the speakers. So we get more dialogue and, you know, Bob does things one way and I might do something another way and go, oh, hey, that's, that's great. Um, uh, and then somebody just asked something about gabapentin. I, I, I really want gabapentin to work as a neuro person because but it doesn't <laughs> it, it it can depending yeah. on the bird it's it's very individualistic Agreed. Um, but but sometimes i think we get all, a little there there are other reasons M one must remember that birds don't pluck their feathers just from born a virus i mean bob keeps bringing up toxins and yeast infections and uh, allergies, allergies to, mi yeah. to mycotoxin i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons. So that's why if that's not working, try something else. Gabapentin has not been real effective in our hands. Uh, when we use it, I think you've got to really increase the dose from what's listed. Um, I don't know, you can oh, comment absolutely. on that. Oh, I haven't. Yeah. I, I, I want to check. The other thing that people do about gabapentin, because I can tell you I made this mistake, is that they take the pill form of it and they make it into solution. I'm going to tell you that here, it will not work. You must yep. use the oral suspension. That, that that's that's me, the veterinary oral suspension. You you can't take and make a suspension with a pill. It 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 will. There the half life is like three to five days. It's, it's way too it doesn't short. work. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, and just to just to let everyone know, we will. Um, We'll, we'll save those unanswered questions for the next time um, and we'll try I to- I think we're going to have to come back, but I think oh my you guys goodness. all need to come to Asheville, North Carolina, well, well, for God's sakes. Yeah, Sign come up. to Ashland. After Ashland, Definitely. we'll do just strictly a Q&A then. How's that? <laughs> that sounds good. I mean, yeah, that's a, I'm, and you got some time to plan for that, but but we should start making some plans uh, sooner than later because June's fast approaching if we're- we're already almost in April. Right. Oh, right. It is, let's, it is. let's finish off with a couple more, I think. Okay. So I had this question uh, about a let's see, a macaw. Where'd it go? Okay, a macaw that tested positive for ABV, should they be kept away from other birds? What type of sanitizing cleaning is best for the cages, the food, the water bowls? No symptoms, but uh, and no clinical signs of illness. So what would you do in that situation or recommend? That's Nothing. a great question because that's a commonly, I, I think that they want to isolate them because they think they have COVID or something. Yeah, they have so this dangerous disease. That. Yeah, it's Just the wrong disease. It's, normal it's, normal husbandry. Normal husbandry. Clean, clean food and water. That's all you got to do. Yep. Because remember where it got, where it gets it. It gets it from the egg or really early in the nest box, commonly. Now, if you put the two birds in the same cage for 10 years, maybe, maybe you're going to, maybe they'll do that, but um, yes, the other one will convert, but um, it's okay. not you're highly contagious. Flu. You're thinking flu. You're not thinking born a virus. It's not okay. highly contagious. That's good. To, okay. Um, so let's see, we, we would be here like literally for like, another couple we got so many great <laughs> questions so i think we're gonna we'll save those ones we've got we've got a bunch um and these ones uh, i mean they're all so so worth like addressing but we'll, we'll i think we'll have to revisit that in a um, upcoming webinar um because i mean you guys are so generous with your time i feel like we would, we would go well into the evening here <laughs> but this is such important it's fun. i so enjoy it <laughs> let's at least do one or two more because bob took too much time for god's okay. sake i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come on. While we wait for, for the hope it was worthwhile. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm announce, we do have a giveaway for today, and I'm announced that winner and play our little um uh, product, uh, the the giveaway product. But let's see. Okay, let's see. If we get one more, one more, uh, one more question for you. And while we wait for that, I'm also gonna say that um 
the pre the prior webinars that you guys um, joined us on about this topic we have on the um, the YouTube channel. So if you go on Lip Fever's YouTube oh, channel, you see nice. those webinars as well as all the other ones we've done. So I encourage you all to check out. Just go on YouTube, uh, Google Lip Fever um, company, and then pop up all those webinars for you to view. Okay, here we go. Um, gosh, this word I don't know why. Onziar, Onziar. Is Onziar approved for use in the U.S. or do you need a special permit to import it? I thought it was an Australian drug. They thought it was an Australian. It used to be, used to be, but it's um, a veterinary drug labeled in the United States. They have a pill form, which honestly I don't know how to use, but they have never the injectable used it form. Um, the injectable form I use every day. It's it's designed for dogs and cats. Works so well. It is a, and I couldn't right. live without it. When you say injectable, so is that something that um, you would have to bring it, your bird into the vet to get it? And obviously, or I teach people how to give their injections at home. Yeah, we do the same. Wow, yes. I'd yes. like to do a webinar on that on how you how you restrict. Oh, it's easy. It's simple. <laughs> oh, one, come on, Laura, one, you can do it. One, once once a week is so much easier than twice a day by mouth, especially in a big macaw. <laughs> okay, okay, that would be interesting. Maybe you guys can demonstrate that with um, a, a live. We can do that. That yeah. would be fascinating. I okay. could use one of my screaming cut of my screaming Amazons. There we go. There it has born a virus. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. We're gonna have that next time. Well, that'd be that'd be interesting to see. Demonstration. Um, <laughs> so we do have a question about okay, uh let's see. Um macaw. Did I already okay? No, this is can we, get a cockatoo? Oh. Can we have a cockatoo question? Because cockatoo. We okay, a let's see if I'm gonna um our behind the scenes guru, Brenda, if you can find a cock to question. Or, or uh, a, a collectus or something. Well, we did the toe Conyers, tapping. Conyers get it, huh? We did the toe tapping for a collectus. Um, oh, Conyers. Yep. Uh, we haven't talked about Conyers that much. That's right. And that's a very popular um, pet. Um, so, okay. co so when you're looking for questions, Conyers tend to get a little bit, it happens typically during their breeding period. Uh, they start to regurgitate a little bit. They get a little thin. They have a thinning of the pectoral muscle mass, typically, is what I see. Bob, what do you see? Yes, same thing. Conyers are kind of like macaws, but not as severe. Yeah. And and not as prevalent. Okay, okay. Um, how about uh, asking for a friend who's stuck at work? So this question is for a friend. Two Quakers, unrelated, living in one cage, green-cheeked conure in an adjacent cage, all died of histopathology proven AGN within a couple of years. All were very sick with classic symptoms, treated by avian vet. First one was a Quaker, and then the second was the Quaker, and then the conure. Um, what would you attribute this to? How do you explain this? sequence of the events. Well, they've, they've got histopath confirmation of avian ganglioneritis. They don't have proof that it was indeed born of virus. Things like that Campylobacter could have been involved and that would be more easily transmitted from bird to bird than the born of virus. Um, I'd like to know how these birds were treated and at what stage of the disease process did they begin treatment? We know that the sooner we get these birds on treatment, the better response we'll see and the more return to normal uh, normalization that we'll see in those birds. If they're, you take this wasted away bird and you try to treat them, you're not going to be as successful. Yeah, and I, I also think that Quakers, there's a lot of Quakers that pluck around their neck um, and it, they, they start there and, and they end up being um, AGAA positive. So those, uh, the Quakers, I don't know if they're related to each other, but, but they could have had this disease for a while. And then there was some kind of stressor in the home that exacerbated the whole thing. And it's odd that the conure died though, because typically conures don't typically die from born a virus, but there I, could have been would, something else going on. I would say it was the disease was probably more advanced before they began any treatment. And then uh, I would really like to define what treatment those birds were given, you know, for this condition. And uh, a comment on Quakers is that those birds are also very, very sensitive to toxicities and allergens. And we see a lot of Quakers with that. Wow. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, someone's asking when the next um, ABB seminar is going to be scheduled. We'll have to. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that up to you, that. Laura. <laughs> As you can see, it's yeah. a very, very, very important and uh, popular topic. Um, I think, uh, okay, so we're going to, I think we'll have to save the rest of the questions. I got to get through the promo video of uh, for today's winner, but um, so <laughs> just yeah, to, yeah, like clarify, Mark and Kat. Half later. <laughs> But next time we're going to schedule you guys for two hours. There we go. We'll move well, it up an hour. When you said, oh, we're going to do this in an hour, I thought, yeah, bad chance. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> we, no, we did get through a lot of questions. So that was, I mean, that was spot on. Um, got through a lot of material. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wait, I had a Moluccan question. Where did that go? Oh, we do have a, a cocktail question for you. How about we're going to okay. end on this question and then, and then we'll schedule our follow-up webinar. Okay. So a friend had a Moluccan um, the molecular that tested positive by necropsy and another um, M2 uh, was in the same cage, eight preen to play together. The cage mate has tested negative for five years. Should she keep testing the bird or should he be kept separate from the other birds? If she's tested it for five years and it's negative, I think pretty good chance that bird's negative. And, and again, it's not highly contagious, so she can keep the bird in her aviary. Just enjoy your bird, for God's sake. Yeah, really, five years, my gosh. Don't get worried. <laughs> enjoy them. Okay, okay. Don't, open, yeah, up that that. <laughs> well, Don't <laughs> open up that can of worms, okay? <laughs> yeah. You had to have the offered home testing. You just be there every, every like, doing home test kit all the time. There okay. we go. <laughs> so, That's an idea, Susan. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Bob. <laughs> I will not be. <laughs> get working on that, okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, okay, so we are definitely going to have to revisit this. This was, um, and, and we'll, we'll budget a little bit more. We'll give it a little extra time so we can get, because we still have like 40 questions that, that we can be here all day. Wow. With. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to announce today's winner of our giveaway, and that is uh, Sharice. So congratulations. Um, you get, uh, and uh, as I as I'm going to play the video of our giveaway product, just the, 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 the accolades and the thank yous are just pouring in on the, the chat feature here. So. Well, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us for the last yes. hour. Yes, thank hour you. Because this is a difficult disease. That's why you're all here. And it's, um, you know, you, you hear so many different things and it, it's very confusing. Um, and, and so, I really appreciate all of you coming and, and listening. And I, I do want to plug the, the, you know, the Phoenix Landing Wellness Retreat only because I organize it every and uh, but but it is an opportunity to get together and, and we will um, try to be members of, of them because we do hold Zoom meetings. Um, in other words, we, we have different speakers and, and right now we have speakers um, once a month, roughly, and we're hoping to have another like Zoom thing in the fall. That's a, sh a little mini thing, um, but we're trying to figure some of that stuff out. So we really appreciate all of you too, because you're all trying to take care of your birds as best you can. And we appreciate those of you who are trying as hard as you can to make your birds have a wonderful life in captivity. Thank you all. Yes, thank Bye. you for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. Oh gosh, and I'm gonna, on behalf of everyone else, thank you the, for for your time today. I mean, it's just very generous, and we obviously it's because you guys have a love of this, the love of birds, and love of you know love of birds, community. love but, of birds, yeah. man. Yes, we do. Thank you all. <laughs> it's been our, our life, Susan. <laughs> all right, guys. yeah. So I'm gonna play it. So this is this is the 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 Peter Premium Daily Pellets. This is going out to Sharice and your bird and, and her their bird. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully, I do this correctly because sometimes I mess this up. Um, okay, here we go. This is. Let's see if it plays. Uh, okay, here we go. So premium daily pellets, uh, they can be offered as the main diet. And um, I know my bird, this is the only, uh, this is the only pellet they eat. <laughs> this is pretty good. Um, and uh, just a sneak preview, next Friday, we're gonna be on with Lisa Bono. She's gonna be talking about hormones. And then at the end of the month, we're gonna be on with, uh, I believe Dr. Tom Tully for another episode of Ask the Vet. So. Yeah. My birds eat little fever pellets too, but they also eat the nutriberries and and they're they're good foods. Dr. Clayson did a great job with them. Nice.
Nice. There you go. Bet approved. <laughs> and then uh, just because we, we mentioned it a few times throughout the webinar about the, the Emirate, uh, which is a vet prescribed diet. Um, and yep. you can you can check that diet out on Lefebvre. Um, I think it's the uh, LefebvreVet.com. You'll see some information. Maybe you can um, ask your vet about it. So on that note, everybody, I'm going to um, tell everyone uh, goodbye until next time. And everyone stay safe. All the best to your flock. Again, thank, thank you, guys. You, so thank you, Laura. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, thank you. And love your birds. Have there a good go. time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.